Okay, so we're going to do a lesson here on function operations today. Before we do that lesson, I've got a few review problems for you on the screen. You can pause it and try these problems now, and then I'm going to go through the answers. 6 and raised to the 3 eighths power here times 6 raised to the 5 eighths power. When you multiply like bases, you add the exponents. So 3 eighths plus 5 eighths would be 8 eighths, or that would be 6 to the first power. Number 2, the 6th root of 17 times the cube root of 17. What you actually have to do to this one to make it easier to do is raise this to the 1 6th power because a 6th root is the same thing as the 1 6th power. And raise this one to the 1 3rd power because a cube root is the same thing as a 1 3rd power. You can go back and review those videos if you need to on rational exponents. But now you have like bases that you're multiplying. So you add the exponents. So you add 1 6th plus 1 3rd. If you need help adding 1 6th plus 1 3rd, you can't do it in your head. Then you take out your handy dandy calculator. And by the way, I'm working on a way to get you access to something very similar to mine, but you can also use Desmos if you would need to. If I add 1 6th plus 1 3rd, oh, it's already on the screen here, sorry. I uh, forgot I did this one the other day and left it on there. 1 6th plus 1 3rd is 0.5. That means it is 17 raised to the 1 half power, or 0.5. That is the same thing as the square root of 17. So in order to get this answer as a radical, you would have to actually change it to the rational exponents first, do the property of exponents of adding those together, and then change it back to the radical. That's the only way you can multiply those two radicals because they are not the same index when you first start. But ones like number 3, you have the 4th root of 5 and the 4th root of 125. You can actually multiply those together because they actually have the same root. They are both 4th roots. So you can just multiply the 5 times 125, and that is 625. Again, you can use your calculator to help you if you need to. But now you can also actually take the 4th root of 625 and get 5 as your answer. So the answer to the 4th root of 625 is 5. Remember what that means is 5 times itself, 4 times, gives me 625. Or 5 to the 4th power is 625. Number 4 is when you get into a little bit more of the simplifying where you cannot always take something out of the radical. Because this is a square root, we don't have perfect squares for everything. So the square root of 121 is 11. That is a perfect square. But z to the fifth is not a perfect square. So the little shortcut that we used was taking the root. Remember, this would be a square root, so it's like there's a little 2 here, even though we don't write it. How many times does 2 go into 5? 2 goes into 5 twice with 1 left over. That means z squared would come out, and 1z or z to the first would be left over on the inside. So remember that little process, that little shortcut I showed you with variables. Number five, we have one of these on the quiz, and we have one of these on the test as well. And this one was kind of the only one that was upsetting or disappointing to see how many people miss one that looks like this. Two on the cube root of four plus three on the cube root of four is five on the cube root of four. Remember, when you're adding and subtracting, adding has to be like terms. And so basically, you treat this just kind of like we do with variables. Add those two things together. Number six and number seven also had very similar problems on the quiz that we just took. So the fourth root of 2x plus 1 equals the fourth root of x plus 6. Notice that the radicals are isolated on each side, and that's the big key step to start off with when you're solving radical equations. But the key step that makes it, uh, gives you the ability, I should say, to solve a radical equation is knowing that the opposite of a root or a radical is a exponent, a power. So the opposite of a fourth root would be raising it to the fourth power. 
So if you want to get rid of a fourth root, you raise it to the fourth power. Because both of these are fourth roots, you can raise both sides. Because what you do to one side, you got to do to the other anyways. You can raise both sides to the fourth power, and it cancels out the radicals. And so it should give you a simple equation that goes all the way back to the very first chapter we did, all the way back to some Algebra 1 skills. So again, this is another one that I was kind of disappointed to see how some of you just way overthinking these, these problems with the radical equations. So this one, just as a quick little review of before, subtract x, you would get 1x. Then you would subtract the 1, and you would get x equals 5. Now the one like number 7 is a little bit more complicated here because you have a radical on one side but not on the other. So when you want to get rid of this radical that you've isolated, you have to square it to get rid of a square root, just like you raised it to the fourth power to get rid of a fourth root. But you also have to square this side. What you do to one side, you got to do to the other. The problem is when you square the left-hand side, you're going to get 2x minus 3. The radical just disappears. But on the right-hand side, you actually have to do x minus 3 times x minus 3. You actually have to multiply those two together. You can't just use a quick little property here because of the subtraction on the inside. We don't have a property for that. So you actually have to multiply x minus 3 times x minus 3. That gives me x times x, which is x squared. x times a negative 3 here is going to be negative 3x. And then another negative 3 times x, that's going to be negative 6x. I know I'm kind of skipping a little step there, so you'd have to go back and review some multiplying like we did before Christmas break if you need some help with that. Negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. So then you end up with this equation here that is a quadratic equation. You have it x squared. So you have to go back to some skills that we did back before Christmas. My suggestion would be to get the 0 on this side, subtract 2x over here, and get negative 8x. Add 3 over here and get plus 12. That's my personal opinion, the best way to set this one up. And then you can take it and you can factor it, because this one does factor. You could also use the quadratic formula, or you could use completing the square. But this splits up into x and x. You have a plus 12 here, so that means minus and minus, because the middle is negative. And then the factors of 12 would be 2 and 6. 2 times 6 is 12, but it also gives me the 8 in the middle. My final answers here would be x equals 2 if you set this equal to 0, and x equals 6 if you set this equal to 0. The problem is, if you take 2 and you plug it into the original equation up here, you're going to get a square root right here of 1 equal to negative 1. While we are solving equations by using the square root, you can get two answers. But when you are solving equations that started out as a positive square root like this one did, this answer won't actually work. It's what we call an extraneous solution. 6 does work, though, because if you plug in 6 here and you plug in 6 here, you will end up with the square root of 9 equals 3, which is true. So, go back and watch these again if you need to. Um, rewind the video if you need to review them again. Now we're going to head on into what we're talking about in this lesson called function operations. So I have a little example here to kind of start off with this concept of function operations. If you have an airplane that's traveling at an airspeed of 415 miles an hour, this function f of x equals 415x represents the distance traveled by the plane in still air. That means every hour that you travel, you're traveling 415 miles. In case you didn't know, that's what speed means. This goes back to the concept of something you probably did in your physical science class. We've done it this year in my class, actually, as well. Distance is equal to rate times time. The distance you travel is equal to how fast you're traveling times how long you've been traveling. That's what this function is, but it's got this fancy little f of x thing. We talked about this little f of x thing earlier in the year, and we essentially said it's a fancy way to write y, so don't panic. It's just telling me that that function represents the plane and how far it travels per hour. 
If the wind speed is 30 miles an hour, then g of x equals 30x represents the function and the motion of the wind. Now that one's a little bit weirder to think about because there's no such thing as a piece of wind, like there's an airplane actually flying through the air. The 30x here means that if you had a particle of wind, it starts here, then 30 miles per hour means an hour later it'd be 30 miles down the road. Now, that's kind of weird to think about because it's wind, right? But what we're looking at there is we're looking at this describes the effect, really, of the wind, not so much the actual wind itself. But 30 miles an hour is the wind speed. If you were to look at a plane traveling through the air, what you're going to notice is that sometimes the wind is going to be at the back of the plane, pushing the plane. Sometimes the wind is going to be at the front of the plane, pushing against the plane. What that causes in a situation, especially for pilots and air traffic controllers, those two specific careers, is that the person who's in charge of that kind of thing needs to understand how that would affect the overall travel of that plane. And so what we have is if we have a plane that is traveling with the wind, that means the wind is pushing at the back of the plane, and if the wind is pushing at the back of the plane, it's actually going to speed up. And so what you end up with is this concept of taking function f and adding it to function g. The plane added to the wind because the wind is actually taking that 415x and adding it to the wind 30x and it creates a new function that means you're playing with the wind. So what would you do here? Think about that for a second. If you had 415x plus 30x, I hope most of you are thinking in your head, hey, Mr. Harrison, shouldn't we just add them? Shouldn't we just collect like terms? I sure hope that's what you're thinking because guess what? That is exactly what you do. When you have two functions and you're adding them together, don't let this little notation here of f of x plus g of x, don't let that scare you. That's not telling you anything weird that you haven't done before. All it's doing is it's distinguishing the fact that you are talking about a plane function and a wind function. So you know which one's which. That's really the primary reason for all these f's and g's and other letters we've learned. So it is just collecting like terms. If you were to add those together, 415x plus 30x, you would get 445x. And typically, a lot of times, when you add functions together, you typically give it a new letter so you know you have a new function. That new function is the plane plus the wind. Think about what that means. That means 445 miles an hour really is your new speed. And so if you are an air traffic controller, or you're a pilot, and you're trying to make sure that you're landing on time, or that you don't land on top of another plane because there can be thousands of planes in the sky at the same time, you've got to make sure that this speed is accounted for. Not just the actual speed that's showing up on the plane speedometer, but also what is the wind doing? How is the wind affecting how fast you actually travel? You're gaining 30 miles every single hour because of the wind. And so to avoid problems and collisions with airplanes, you have to understand some math there. I know not everybody's going to be a pilot. I know not everybody's going to be an air traffic controller, but many of you in your future will ride on an airplane. You will travel on an airplane. You will hope that somebody paid attention in their out of two class, maybe. We'll see. So what would happen if the wind was traveling or pushing against the plane? If the wind was pushing against the plane, what would that be? Would that be adding the wind? No. That would be taking and actually subtracting. So you would be talking about f of x minus g of x. You would be talking about 415x minus 30x, which is 385x. This new type of function, I'll use i of x. doesn't really matter what letters you use there, but we'll keep in order there alphabetically. That new function represents a plane traveling against the wind. So that plane is going to have to make sure that they are aware of that considerably uh, lower 
speed there because they're going to have to monitor their fuel a lot more. They may need more fuel if they're traveling against the wind the whole time across the country or some type of trip. So this concept that we're talking about today is function operations, meaning you're taking functions and you're adding them together, you're subtracting them, you're multiplying them, and you're dividing them. We'll also look at one other type of uh, function operation called a composition of functions as well. And we'll talk about how it uh, could be applied in a more real life situation without all the X's and stuff as well. Now, one more thing before we leave this page. Just realize that in real life, you also have things that would go, uh, involve a little bit of vector calculus and stuff if you had wind approaching from a different angle as well. And it's not just approaching straight from the front, straight from the back. When you get into that, it gets even into more and more complicated math because then you start talking about the angle that it's approaching and how that affects the speed and things like that. So it gets, uh, gets very convoluted if you get into the higher levels of math there. So what we're talking about today is function operations. So uh, if you're wanting to uh, go with me and, and um, you know, try to copy down some notes, you can do that. You're always welcome to come back to these videos later if you want. But function operations is in your textbook, and it is in section 5.5 five in your textbook. So you can look that up if you need to. So what we're doing is we're talking about the concept of taking functions and adding them, subtracting them, multiplying, and dividing them. So one of the things that uh, we're going to do here is just, you know, practice this with a couple of different functions. So I'm going to make two functions up off the top of my head. Again, I'll repeat, I'm making these up. No special connection to the airplane we were just looking at. This is just Mr. Harrison coming up with random things off the top of his head. So f of x is going to be 2x plus 1, and g of x is going to be x minus 3. We'll just use these two functions as our examples. I will probably have to, as I go through this, kind of uh, write and erase, write and erase. So you will have to, if you're taking notes, you may have to go back, you may have to pause and things like that. So the first thing we'll talk about is addition. So we'll talk about what does it mean to add two functions. Now we've actually done that with the airplane example already, so not going to spend an inordinate amount of time, but I do want to make sure you understand that if you are adding, you may see it written like this, f plus g of x, or you may see it written like this, f of x plus g of x, or you may see words that say add two functions together, or find the sum of two functions, that could be the case. Uh, and then in general, there's a lot of different situations in life where there might be other words like total, use something like that. So if we add two functions together, that means we're taking 2x plus 1, that's f of x, plus x minus 3, that's g of x. And we're adding those together. But even though this looks a little uglier than the plain example, you're still collecting like terms. What is 2x plus 1x? That is 3x. What is 1 minus 3, or 1 plus negative 3? That's negative 2. That would be a new function that you just found by adding f of x and g of x together. Now, one thing we're also going to revisit here, all the way back from the second chapter this year, everybody's favorite thing, we talked about it the other day with our graphing of our radical functions, is domain. So remember the x values are the domain. When you look at this linear function, mx plus b, 3x minus 2, you should be able to recognize that a linear function will always be all real numbers for the domain. And so we're going to talk about that. There's going to be some times and things that you have to watch out for, like we said with radicals, but the domain can be any real number. Do be prepared that some of the things in your textbook, when we start assigning these programs in your textbook, you may have to write it in that interval notation that we talked about, negative infinity up to positive infinity. That means you can plug in any x that you want in this function. So, take a few minutes there, study that, look at that if you need to. Like I said, I am going to erase here, and I'm going to go and move into 
subtraction. I may need to pause the video from now on when I go to a race. That may save me a little bit of time, a little bit of precious seconds, and so I don't have to talk like this to waste seconds. So let's talk about subtraction. So subtraction can be written like this, f minus g of x, or you may see it written like this, f of x minus g of x. This is when you take function for f, 2x plus 1, and you subtract the function for g, x minus 3. Notice with subtraction, though, we talked about this earlier in the year. Notice again, this is still collecting like terms. What we've already done, it's not new. But now all of a sudden we've got these f's and g's and we panic a little bit, but it's not new, still collecting like terms. But now we also have to take into consideration here, we're subtracting. And so one of the things we talked about with subtraction earlier in the year is I suggested that you distribute this negative to both of these to make this one become negative, make this one become positive, and then do your whole leave, change, change thing. That's my very strong suggestion. So you don't do something kind of goofy when you're subtracting. So you would end up with 2x and a negative x, or 2x minus x. And then you would end up with 1 plus 3, or 1 minus a negative 3, same thing. You get 4. This is my new function that I get when I add, or excuse me, subtract f and g. Notice, though, that that would be very different if I did g of x minus f of x. So be careful and make sure you understand that subtraction, you have to watch out for your order. Make sure you pay attention to the problem. And if it was a real-life example, for instance, if you wanted to find the profit for a company, you would take revenue minus expenses, not expenses minus revenue. If you did that, you'd screw up pretty bad and you'd think things were worse or you may think things are better than they really are. So be careful. Make sure you do revenue minus expenses or profit. So when you're looking at subtraction, it's important to make sure you pay attention to the order. But it's still just collecting like terms like we have done in the past. Notice that this one is also a linear equation, x plus 4, so the domain would also be all real numbers for this one. You could plug in anything you want for this new function that you've got. When you get new functions for division, a lot of times we're going to have to watch out for that big time. We'll talk about that in a second. All right, so let's take a look at multiplication. Multiplication, exactly like it sounds, you're going to multiply two functions together. Now we haven't done an example of this one yet like we did with the airplane with addition and subtraction. But with multiplication what we're doing is we're taking f times g of x. Be aware that that is a little dot right here, the multiplication dot. Sometimes you may see an actual multiplication symbol there, the little x, but not typically when you're dealing with a bunch of f of x and g of x stuff. You may also, like I said, see it like this, f of x times g of x like this, it means you're taking function f, 2x plus 1, and multiplying it by function g, x minus 3. Now stop just a second before I say anything. What do you think you would do right here? What method have we already done numerous times this year when we multiply two things like this? Oh, you're exactly right. The FOIL method or distributive property is really the proper term here. We're going to multiply. What is 2x times x? 2x squared. What is 2x times negative 3? Negative 6x. What is 1 times x? 1x. What is 1 times negative 3? Negative 3. So you get 2x squared minus 5x minus 3. Notice that my new function on this one, when I multiply these two linear pieces together, is now a quadratic. But that still doesn't change the fact that if I think about the way this thing is shaped, like a parabola, it's still going to have a domain of all real numbers because it's going to touch every x value eventually. Now here's the tricky part though. The y values, this thing would be opening up. So the y values would not go below this point. So my range would be y is greater than or equal to some point here at the bottom. So you've got to be careful with your range on a parabola 
but your domain that we talked about earlier in the school year, you can still turn or plug in, I should say, all real numbers into this. You can plug in as many numbers as you want. There's no limit to what you can plug in for X. This is not like a radical where you have to be careful with negatives and things like that. So you can plug in anything you want into that function still. Domain is still all real numbers. All right, so our final thing would be division. This would be something like F divided by G of X. Sometimes you'll actually see the actual division symbol there. Or F of X divided by G of X. I primarily like this way of writing it right here because that's actually what you're going to do. Now, division may bring up and conjure up bad memories of long division and synthetic division. But the good news is, is we are not typically going to use those unless we're trying to help us factor some things like we did with ugly polynomials. So the good news is, is we won't be working with those as much as we used to. So what we are actually going to see here is taking f of x divided by g of x, it's going to look something like this. The reason I put them in parentheses is to stay consistent with the other ways that I wrote with addition and subtraction and multiplication with my parentheses, to stay consistent, but also to point out something. This 2x plus 1 and this x minus 3 is a whole function, but it's also technically a whole factor. Factors are things that are split up by multiplication. x minus 3, that does not mean x is a factor and 3 is a factor. Those are terms. Please understand the difference. x minus 3 is a factor altogether. Let me write another example over here to the side to show you a little bit what I'm talking about there. If I had x plus 2 times x minus 1, over x plus 2, x plus 2 is a factor. x plus 2 on top is a factor. x minus 1 is a factor. They're split up by multiplication. When you are dealing with division, if you have a factor on the top and a factor on the bottom that can cancel out, meaning it's the exact same factor, then you can cancel them out and simplify the function. If it is not the exact same factor, you cannot do that. And so when you look at this example right here, 2x plus 1 and x minus 3 are not the exact same factor. So don't try to cancel out the x's. I know that's what your brain kind of wants to do when you see it, but that's not mathematically possible. It has to be things that are factors. If I went back to something real simple, what I would say is if you had 2 times x divided by 2, you could divide the 2's and get 1x. But you can't do that if you had 2 plus x divided by 2. That's not the same thing. So be aware of how addition and subtraction and multiplication differ from each other, especially when you're dealing with something like that in a division problem. Here's the other thing that you really have to watch out for with division. With division, you have to watch out for the bottom of the fraction. And this is kind of laid out in this sentence at the bottom down here. So it says the quotient or division does not include x values for which g of x equals 0. Meaning, simple way to put this, you can't divide by 0. So whatever you plug in on the bottom cannot make the bottom be 0. So x minus 3 is on the bottom. That means if I were to actually plug in what right here? 3 actually would make it be zeros because 3 minus 3. Guys, that just goes back to a little thing that we talked about in the past. If you set x minus 3 equal to 0, that means 3 would make it be 0, right? Well, that's not a good thing on the bottom of a fraction. So if you're talking about this function, it means that you cannot plug in 3. You can plug in anything you want. You can plug in positives. You can plug in negatives. You can plug in 0 on the bottom. 0 minus 3 would be negative 3. But you cannot plug in 3 because it would make the bottom be 0. And you've probably heard math teachers tell you you can't divide by 0.
if you're dividing something up, you can't divide something zero times. So when you're looking at this, three cannot be plugged in on the bottom. What I'm looking for when you are doing these division problems is if you can see if factors cancel out and see if something makes the bottom equal zero, you cannot plug that in. Those are the two big keys that I'm looking for because actually later in the year, we are actually going to do functions that look like this. They're called rational functions. We're not there yet, and we're not ready for that, so we're not going to worry about that yet. We're going to worry about can we cancel out factors if it's possible, and can we look at the bottom and decide what cannot be plugged in because we don't want the bottom to be equal to zero. One thing I will warn you about, like this one over here where you do have this canceling out, x plus 2, you still cannot plug in negative 2 right here, even in this function that you got as your answer, because the original function had this x plus 2 on the bottom. We're going to talk about what that means later when we get to rational functions, but you do need to be aware of that. Anything that makes the bottom of the fraction equal 0 before you factor out and cancel or after you get your factors, it doesn't matter. Anything that makes the bottom equal zero, you cannot plug in. It's kind of the whole reason we also had, remember the slope, where you had a slope with the bottom of the fraction being zero, that is no slope, a vertical line. Same kind of concept. All right, so we're going to do a couple more practice problems or our function operations now. And uh, I've got a, just, we're not going to do every single one of these examples, but I've got a couple functions here, f of x and g of x. And we're going to find the sum of the functions. So what does that mean? That means we're taking f of x and we're adding it to g of x. So we're going to take 2x to the 1 half power, add that to negative 6x to the 1 half power. Again, think like terms, so don't overthink this too much. 2x to the 1 half plus negative 6x to the 1 half would be negative 4x to the 1 half. Notice you just collect your like terms, you just add those together. We're not going to do the difference here, so I'm going to cross that out so it doesn't confuse you if you're taking notes and things. But we have negative 4x to the 1 half. Here's where you need to be a little careful though. Remember, like I said, the domain is going to be something that's important to understand because we're getting into some, a little bit weirder and more complicated functions as we go. Notice that x to the 1 half is right here. Remember, x to the 1 half is the same thing as the square root of x. So what is it that I cannot plug in to a square root? I cannot plug in negative numbers. It would give me imaginary answers. So my domain would be x is greater than or equal to 0. Now, if there was a plus or minus number in here, you'd also have to adjust that because you could plug in some negatives sometimes when there's some plus numbers in there because it moves the function to the left like we talked about with our graphs. But with a normal, just regular old square root of x, you can't plug in negatives. Another way to write that is to have our little interval notation 0 up to infinity meaning I can plug in 0 and everything above that, but I cannot plug in negatives into a square root. Then I have these here. Find the product and the quotient here. I'm going to take a look at these with you real quick. Actually, let's just take a look at the quotient only. Let's not do the product. So quotient is division, right? So that means f of x divided by g of x. Again, remember, you can pause the video and try it if you want. We take 3x divided by x to the 1 fourth power. When you divide like bases, what do you do with the exponents? You subtract them. So what is 1 minus 3, uh, 1 fourth here? That would be 3, and x would be raised to the 3 fourths, because that would be 1 minus 1 fourth is 3 fourths. So this thing simplifies to this right here. Remember that 4, though, on the bottom is a fourth root. So I still have to watch out because my domain would tell me that in a fourth root, just like a square root, I cannot plug in numbers that are negative. Now here's the other thing you got to watch out on this one. 
on the bottom of the fraction is what you normally have down here, a fourth root at the beginning of this. You also cannot divide by zero, so you actually have to erase the equal to part. So the only numbers you can actually plug into this are positive numbers. I know that's kind of weird because that means I have to think back to something that cancels out essentially to this. This is simplified. But this original function had this x on the bottom, so I couldn't plug in 0. That's going to be something that you, you know, have some issues with as we learn this. Like I said, we're also going to spend more time with this later in the year with more about these types of functions that do that. So, I understand uh, if you mess up some stuff now, but be careful with that with your domain. So the last thing that we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to talk about something called a composition of functions. A composition of functions is essentially when you have one function performed on x, an input, and then the output of that is plugged back into another function and you perform the operations and get another output. Um, physically, if you think about it, uh, it would be similar to having two little assembly lines and we've kind of talked about this idea of a function machine earlier in the school year. It's been a little while I know but you take x and you plug it into one function g of x you get an output y and that output y becomes the input for the next function f of x and you get a, another y over here and we'll say this is, even though it's not the same as like slope, we'll say this is y1 and this is y2. But you are performing one function, get an answer, plugging that into another function, get an answer. Real life example, if you think about if you are working for somebody that produces, a, you know, some type of technology, we'll say, like a computer. And you're in charge of taking all the materials for the uh, soundboard or the graphics board. You plug it in, you do all the stuff, you arrange it properly, you do all the soldering on it and make sure that the board is correctly assembled, and you get this new sound board that comes out. This new sound board is your output from plugging in all the materials. Then you take that sound board and you do all the things that you need to do it to prepare it to plug it into an actual computer. You combine it with the video graphics board and you combine it with uh, just your motherboard and things like that are in a computer. I know I'm oversimplifying the process, but there's a lot more that goes into it, obviously. But then you get your output over here would be the actual computer. And that ability to think in a sequential manner like that and to perform one operation and then perform another operation, that is essentially what a composition of functions is. And so it's taking one function, doing the math, doing the stuff, and then plugging it into another function once you get an answer. Mathematically, that is something that you will see. For instance, if you had um, f of x is equal to 2x and g of x is equal to x squared, if you do g of 3, well, let me write down the right thing, g of 3, that means you're plugging in 3, you're doing 3 squared, and you get 9. This is the input, and this is the output. But then if you take that output, and you do f of 9, you take that output, and you plug it into the function f, you do 2 times 9, you get 18. So you've just taken the input, plug it into g, and get an output. You take the output from g, plug it into f, get an output. What you have just done is you have done f of g of 3. I know that sounds kind of weird the way I said that, f of g of 3. But if you look at this inside here, that's g of 3. f of g of 3 is what that says. So what you've just done is you've plugged in the answer from g of 3, which is 9, into f of x. And so this is called a composition of functions, when you essentially do two functions in a row. And so like I said, it has you know, physical applications when you're you know, building something, like a computer or something like that. But it also has applications in, in a job situation where you go through and you perform a certain set of operations on a number to get an answer.
And then that number that you get helps you to make the next decision and what you plug into the next thing. Uh, whether you have a negative profit in a month and you know you're supposed to notify your boss and tell them, hey, we had a negative profit last month. This is the things that we need to cut down so we don't have a negative profit. That's function operations. That's a composition, basically. You also will see this with two functions and you don't actually have a number to plug in. So it looks like this right here, f of g of x. That means you have g of x happening first and then f of x happening second. And that's kind of hard to realize the way it's written. But g of x, the one on the inside, happens to x first and then the one on the outside. What that looks like, though, without any numbers involved, is you take f of g of x. Essentially what it means is you take g of x and you plug it into f of x, just like we plugged in the output from g of x just a minute ago. You plug in the whole function, which is the whole thing, the output into f of x. So in this first example right here, f of g of x, it means instead of 3 x minus 1, where the x is at right there, you're going to plug in 2x minus 1. So we're going to take 2x minus 1, and we're going to put 2x minus 1 where the x used to be in 3x minus 1. So we're literally taking this function and plugging it into the other. That's what a composition of function looks like algebraically. Mathematically, like I said, that's when you plug in one number into the first one plug in that answer into the other one and get another final answer. But algebraically with x's, this is what it looks like. If you look at this, this should look very familiar. Earlier in the year, we did something with, call, uh, with the substitution method for solving systems of equations, and we substituted one equation into another. Essentially, guys, that's what you are doing here. It's the same concept, we're just not using it in the same way where we're solving for two different variables, x and y. So what we're doing here is just obtaining a new function. That means we're doing g of x first, and then f of x on the outside of that. But all you do is basically follow the operations now. Notice this 3 in front of this parentheses, you would distribute the 3. 3 times 2x would be 6x, 3 times negative 1 would be negative 3, and then you have a minus 1 over here, so that would be 6x minus 4. So that would be my new function that I would get if I performed g of x first on the input, and then f of x second. That's what it looks like. Now if you did the other one, I'm going to draw a little arrow over here, g of f of x means you take g of x, which is 2x minus 1, and you plug in f of x into g of x. So you get 2 times 3x, which is 6x, 2 times negative 1, which is negative 2, and then minus 1 over here, so that'd be 6x minus 3. That would be g of f of x. That means you would be performing f of x first, and then g of x. Notice that it doesn't give me the same answer, and that's important to understand because in real life that has a connection that we'll try to make here in just a second. So also just be aware that you'll have to watch out for the domain at some, at some times. Down here, we're not going to do this one, but f of f of x means you would plug in f of x into itself. So you'd plug in a 3x minus 1 into this x again. And sometimes that happens, like I said, in a real world situ situation where you perform one function over and over and over again repeatedly on the same uh, number that you started with would change every single time, every single time. So, for, for instance, if you did x minus 2, and x minus 2, and x minus 2, and x minus 2, where you subtracted 2, subtracted 2, subtracted 2, that's the same function over and over again. That would be like an f of f of x situation. <laughs> I know that sounds really weird. Sorry. Uh, you guys are probably laughing at me anyways. So. An application of this type of thing in a real-life situation has to do with consumer science, uh, in particular buying things. And so I'm going to go through this example, and this will be the last thing on this video. Um, and uh, then uh, I'll talk about your homework at the end of the video. And I'll also talk about uh, that uh, through some messages and things that I send you. So consumer issues. Suppose you're shopping in a store that has a 20% off sale on everything. You have a coupon worth $5 off any item. Part A says use functions to model discounting an item by 20%. 
and to model applying the coupon. Notice they are plural functions. We're going to use two different functions. Let x be the original price. So we're going to do two different functions here. We're going to do g of x and f of x. And we'll start with f of x first. And then g of x will be our other function. One of these functions is going to represent the 20% off sale. So if you're taking 20% off any item, it'd be 20% off the original price x. Now this, um, I'm going to assume that you guys have done some work with percentages in the past. I know you have in my class, just a little bit back in the first chapter especially. And then we've talked about it just a little bit. But in Algebra 1, you should have definitely looked at some percentages and uh, any other previous algebra foundations and algebra intermediate algebra. If you took a 20% off sale, what that would mean is you're taking the original price x and subtracting 20% of the original price. So 0 0.20 times the original price. Guys, what this does is this takes the original price and subtracts the 20% of the original price. When you do 20%, it's 0 0.20 of means multiply the original price. Just like if you did half of the original price, you do one half of x. But if you notice right here and you subtract those, you would have 1 minus 0.2. That would be 0 0.80. If you think about this logically for just a moment, use your noggin. 80% of x is what that means. That means if you take 20% off, you would do 80% of the price. That's what you actually pay. This is nice and handy if you're going to a store and you know there's a 25% off sale. You're going to pay 0.75 of the original price. You could take out your little iPhone and figure out how much money you need to buy something. So that is the 20% off sale. Now we're going to use another function for the coupon. Now remember the coupon is $5 off any item. So that's just taking the original price and subtracting 5. That function is a lot simpler to figure out than the 80% or 20% off sale. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use our example of a composition. It says part B here, use a composition to model how much you would pay if the clerk applies the discount before the coupon. Now this is the hard part right here, discount before coupon. That means that you're actually doing the 20% off first before the $5 coupon. What that means is actually is G of F of X. And I know that's weird because you think it should be the opposite. You think you should do F of G of X. But remember what I told you over here. The one that is on the inside is actually the one that happens to X first. Then the one on the outside. The one on the inside, G of 3 here, happened first then the one on the outside, f of 9. So the one that happens first is actually on the inside. So if we do the discount first, we're going to have 0.80x plugged in to g of x. What that means is you would have 0.80x minus 5. There's nothing you can really simplify with that other than the fact that you could do 0.8x or 0.80x minus 5. You could take it out of the parentheses. But that means you would take 80% of the item and then subtract $5 for your coupon. So now we're going to use a composition to model, part C here, how much you would pay if the clerk applies the coupon before the discount. Again, important here, coupon before the discount. That means you are actually going to do f of g of x. Because g of x is the coupon, f of x is the discount. So the coupon happens to x first, then f of x, then the discount. Again, g of x first, f of x second. And that's what it looks like mathematically. Now, what it looks like over here when you plug this in is a little different now. This means you would take... 0 0.80 times x, but instead of x, you're plugging in g of x. You're plugging in x minus 5 into the function f of x. You're plugging this one into this one, like I said here, taking it, plugging it in there. If you do that, 
that is going to give me 0 0.80 times x, 0.80x, 0 0.80 times negative 5 is negative 4. So when you do that model first, it would be 0.80x minus $4. So look at question D, and this is where the real life lesson comes into play here, and the reason that these are always they're different from each other here. How much more is any item if the clerk applies the coupon first? Pause the video and think about that for just a second. How much more is any item if the clerk applies the coupon first? So if the coupon comes first every single time, Notice that it's minus 4 here instead of minus 5. That means if the coupon is applied first, every item there is always going to be $1 more expensive. Now that doesn't sound ridiculously crazy, but this is why when you go to a store and they give you a coupon, they don't let you use it with a discount. Because the computers are set up to do the discount first, the percentage, when you scan the item, and then the coupon. The store would be losing money that way and losing more of it. That's why, if it's very rare, if they do let you, most stores won't let you do a coupon on top of a discount. So if you ever find a store that does let you do some things like that, take advantage of it. So you're basically kind of ripping off the company for once instead of them ripping off you. So be careful and pay attention to things like that. But that's a, an application of where that composition comes into play in real life. So your homework, uh, guys, is going to be on page 278 in your textbook. Um, let me see if I can get this thing to... Let me do this. Let me copy and paste it. Okay. Again, sorry guys, I didn't have this done ahead of time, but I'm just trying to Help you guys out here a little bit. We'll copy and paste this so you can see it on your actual screen, a little bit larger size. Uh, we'll copy it to the clipboard, paste it on there, and we'll give a little expand here. There you go. Kind of blurry, but uh, at least you got it a little bit larger on your screen there. This is your homework in your textbook. I'm also going to assign this homework uh, using your online textbook. So I'm going to actually assign it to you. If you do not do this on your online textbook, then you need to make sure that you send me a picture or submit it through Schoology through the assignment submission. You need to be able to submit this to me in one of two ways, like I said, through a picture or through Schoology. But the easiest way for you is probably going to be to actually just do the work assignments that are assigned in your textbook. Go to your online textbook and the assignments will be there on the screen. So when you go to open your textbook each day, you are going to click on that textbook and you'll click on this little Envision Custom Algebra 2. When you come to this main page right here in the middle, you are going to have your assignments ready to go. And so you'll be good to go and you'll be able to actually find your answers there. All right. So this thing is not liking me now. Let's see if it'll let me click this. Sorry, guys. So again, I'll send out. All right, so sorry guys, I know that was kind of cutting off near the end there. Um, I will send out some more instructions later too about accessing your textbook, but this assignment will be a whole lot easier if you just go through and click on it through your textbook and turn it in through there. Then I'll have a record of those who did it and those who didn't, and then I'll be able to give you credit and keep up with our grades in Schoology. Guys, we're going to kind of, we're going to try to keep trucking. I know this, uh, this situation sucks. It's not the most ideal situation, but it is where we're at. And so you guys will uh, still be getting some lessons from Mr. Harrison, obviously. So, see you later.